Oh, bloody hell. You're on the Clark the Shark show. The itchy kitchy shark, the sharky, the little sharky's underground garage. It's like little Steven, but better. Oh, so much better, baby. At 1 800 449 the Clark the Shark show from the golden EIB Sharkerphone. And baby, have we got an album for you. From one of me favorite years, 1966. The year where Frank Zappa put out Freak Out. And the music machine. <laughs> Turn on by the music machine and the standells. And just all these incredible bands in America. These garage bands were returning to the garage. Bands... No, just in England and in America, bands like The Remains and bands like, oh man, The Count Five. But there was no better band than this one from England called The U. And this album, a quick one, <laughs> also known as Appy Jack. And of course, The Who would have a different release in America as they did in England of this second album. And this album is nothing, nothing, nothing like the Who Sings My Generation or My Generation, that first album by the U, 1965. That was bluesy, produced by Shel Talmy. But this one's self-produced by Kit Lambert, and it's totally different. It's much more poppy. And it's, you know, it's got that who energy. Just that, oh, angry Keith Moon drumming on I Need You. The Who, a quick one. Second album. And I love this cover, man. This cartoon of the Who. They're like, just these four guys. <laughs> Whoever painted this cover. I love it. The Who, a quick one, 1966. Ah, oh, you got to love The Who. I'd give this five stars, but let's see what they gave it. They gave it, oh, it's not bad. It's like four stars. Three stars. Who gave The Who three stars? It's a four-star album, baby. The Who. Run, 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 you know. It's not me favorite Who song. The first track on side one. It's by Pete Townsend, but it's like, come on, Who, you can do better than run, run, run. It's so bland and generic. I mean, but it's the Who, man. I, I'll accept it. Run, run, run by the Who. But the next song is a classic by The Who that they always play live, baby, on Little Sharky's Underground Garage. Way better than Little Steven, baby. At 1-800-449-8255, The Clark, The Shark Show, That Wolfman Jack on Crack, baby. I love all of you. But I love Boris the Spider by The Who, even more by John Entwistle. It's just got the... Really twangy, thick bass. The bass is like lead guitar on Boris the Spider. I love it, man. It makes up for Run, 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 that generic, bland song. That ought to be off a Beatles revolver. It's like a loser by John Lennon. Run, Run, Run. It's like Dr. Robert. <laughs> At 1-800-449-8255. The Clark the Shark Show, But I Need You by Keith Moon. This is one of the Who's greatest songs because Keith is just pounding the drums. I love I Need You by the Who. Keith Moon. I love it. Lead vocals by Moon. It's so awesome. I Need You. And now you're like, I'm in Who heaven on this second album. I didn't really like Run, 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 but I love... Boris the Spider, and I need you. I want to hear more who. Oh, you're about to hear more. Whiskey Man 
by Ant Whistle. Fucking killer, man. Whiskey Man. Whiskey Man's my friend. He's with me nearly all the time. He always joins me when I drink and we get on just fine. Nobody has ever. Oh, Whiskey Man. Three great songs in a row. And you're in Who Heaven on side one, baby. Now, if there's a, another letdown, it's Heat Wave. You know, it's like run, run, run. It's like, what are you doing? Who with Heat Wave cover? But I, you know, I can kind of appreciate it. Heat Wave by The Who. Because The Who, you know, they love the Tamla Motown, you know, the Holland, Edward Holland. Yeah, all the English bands wanted to be play Motown like the girl groups over in Detroit at whatever Hitsville, USA. Motown. Heatwave by the U. I can kind of dig it, man. I mean, Heatwave and Run, Run, Run are kind of let downs on side one. But I'm still digging it because I'm like, you know, it's the U. And I love it. Of course, Cobwebs and Strange. Another song by Keith Moon. Which is one of the greatest Who songs, man. Just a bunch of noise. It's so terrible. Went Whistle's playing all these overdubbed horns. And all the Who are just making noise. This is so terrible and horrible. Cobwebs and strange. But I love it, man. Clark the Shark loves me some cobwebs and strange. And side one, man. Four out of six, baby. Oh, <laughs> Four of these songs are Who classics. Now, I'm not so sure about Run, 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 but I love Side One, man. I love it. And all those bands, you know, over in America, they're like, yeah, we we kind of dig it. This noisy band from England, you. And Cobwebs and Strange. Just, you know, Keith Moon. is His second song he's written on Side One. But I love it, man. The instrumental. The Who are... Uh, all the Who instrumentals, like the Overture from Tommy. <laughs> the Who are so great at instrumentals. The Quadrophenia and the Rock. The Who instrumentals have to be the best instrumentals in rock. I love them. But there's none better than Cobwebs and Strange. Where they're just making bloody horrible, awful noise. They probably dreamed this song up when they met at Oxford. <laughs> they were gathered at Oxford to drink tea, have a donut and some coffee, and they dreamed up Cobwebs and Strange by Keith Moon. Man, side one is heavenly on this album, man. I love The Who's first album. But this second album goes to some weird next level. Boris the Spider, I Need You, Whiskey Man. And Cobwebs and Strange. <laughs> the Who are letting it be known right now. They're like, we're going to be huge. And this second album, we're letting you know. The Who can write songs, even if they're not by Pete. Even if Entwistle wrote some and Keith Roots, <laughs> Keith Moon wrote some. <laughs> It's awesome, man. Side one of this album. I love it. Clark the Shark Show loves it. And now you're in heaven, baby. You didn't die. You're just in Clark the Shark's heaven, man. Little Sharky's underground garage, baby. Little Steven, eat your heart out. You're just a mediocre guitar player from Bruce Springsteen. You don't know anything about an underground garage like Clark the Shock from GE at 1-800-449-8255. The fabulous, amazing Clark the Shark show from the golden EIB Sharkophone, baby. There's only one little Sharky, and he's the most amazing Sharky, all five foot six of him. And don't look away which is by Pete Townsend, uh, which is kind of a who throwaway, you know, don't look away. I mean, side two, I'm, I'm not so sure 
about don't look away. It's like another run, run, run. I mean, come on, Pete, you can do better than don't look away. <laughs> but see my way. I kind of like the Roger Daltrey song. You know, the, there was a special contract that the U signed at Oxford where they're like, each of you have to write a song for the second album, you know. You gotta write at least one. And you can do one Tamla Motown, you know, if you want. But we're going to gather over at Oxford. And you guys have to each write a song. Roger, Keith, even Keith write two songs, mate. So Roger came up with See My Way. And I love, I like See My Way. I don't love it. But I think it's kind of an improvement over Don't Look Away. You know, come on, Roger. Pete, you should let Roger write more songs. Like, don't, don't Look Away is not that good, and Run, Run, Run is not that good. But See Me Way is all right by Roger Daltrey, making his songwriting debut. His first and last song he ever wrote for the U. You know, I like it. See Me Way, you know. I do, do, do. You don't have to ask why. Do, do, do. If you see my way. It's like Buddy Ollie. It's got a little drum beat like, with Keith. I like See My Way. It's all right, you know. It makes up for a Don't Look Away, which is kind of dreadful by Pete Townsend. But, you know, both of the songs, are, they're kind of generic, you know, starting outside to side two tracks one and two. Oh, but the who are about to make up for it baby with this little song by pete townsend that i think all of you know very well so sad about us ding, 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 ding. so sad about us has to be one of the most amazing who songs it's right there with can't explain and the kids are all right Maybe even me generation. So Sad About Us is an incredible song by Pete Townsend. I love it. One of the greatest songs by the U. So Sad About Us by the U. And Pete Townsend, he's like, I'm going to make up for it right now on this song. I ain't going to write So Sad About Us. And it's such a great song. I love So Sad About Us because... It reminds me of every bird I ever went out with. I took to an L.A. Kings hockey game. And maybe the date didn't go anywhere. But I'm so sad about us. And Pete wrote a song, man. So sad about us. Track three on side two. And now, man, we've got like five or six really good Who songs on this second Who album. And there's only four songs on side two, and there's a reason why. And that's because you're about to hear one of the most amazing, incredible Who songs. A quick one, While He's Away, which of course is many, many, many songs by Pete Townsend, all put together. Now, the original version of A Quick One, While He's Away, is not as good as when the Who play this live is so much better at all, you know, the Rolling Stones circus and live at Leeds everywhere. You got to hear the version of Live at Hall. I mean, it's, it's very good. Whenever the Who play a quick one while he's away, it's always good. I, I'm not so sure if I'm wild about the version at Monterey Pop, but everyone says, oh, you had to be there at Monterey to see the Who, to really understand when they smash their gear at the end of the show. That gig's amazing, though, man. Monterey Pop or the Who are just dressed up in these psychedelic outfits. I mean, the Who aren't their best, and they don't have their Marshall stacks at that gig at Monterey Pop. I wish the Who would have had all their Marshalls, man, with Pete with more of that fuzz distortion. You know, as it is, live at Monterey in 1967, everyone, even David Crosby, that douchebag David Crosby, he's like... Uh, the Who were amazing. I mean, Stephen Stills and Peter Tork. Everyone, you know, Cass Elliot. Everyone, Jimi Hendrix, Brian Jones. They're like, The Who were the most amazing band <laughs> at Monterey Pop. 
And, of course, the Who played a quick one while he's away and substitute. You know, it's not the best Who gig, man. Pete, he's struggling with those super Beatle amps at Monterey. And, you know, the Who aren't loud enough. And But Keith is really great, you know. And, of course, John Entwistle, his bass is just this twangy. It doesn't sound as twangy going through the super Beatle amps that Kit Lambert rented for the gig. You know, because there was money was tight. The Who had no money. And the Who were in debt like 10,000 quid. <laughs> like 100,000 quid from Oxford. The Who were in debt from smashing their gear at Monterey. And they couldn't get their martial gear. So they were using these super Beatle amps at Monterey. And that's a bummer, man. Because the Who, they would have been so much better at Monterey Pop if they had... Oh, all their gear at that. If they had all their shit together at Monterey Pop, the Who would have been so amazing. They were amazing as it is, the way they were dressed. Pete was wearing these lace ruffles, and Roger and Keith and John just had these wild outfits on. It's a great gig, the Who at Monterey Pop, 1967. I think the Who blow every band away, but the end of that gig where the crowd is just screaming for the Who. They're just screaming hysterically as the Who smash their gear. And all these people are on stage scared, grabbing their microphones, grabbing this their gear because the Who are going to wreck it all. you got to get on stage. Get all our amplifiers, our PA, our microphones. Or Pete and Keith are going to destroy it with Roger. And all these guys were on stage at Monterey. They just looked terrified of the Who as they were grabbing the gear from Pete. And Pete's just like, give me that. I want to smash it. <laughs> I love the Who at Monterey Pop, man. Even if it's not the best Who, you got to love that gig. But I love a quick one while he's away. Even this version on the album is pretty good. It's not the best uh, the Who could have done. And, of course, the next album after this album... The Who would go and record The Who Sell Out. And they would take the concept for a quick one while he's away. And they would turn it into a whole amazing album in 1967. The Who Sell Out. It's just, oh man, Armenia City in the Sky. I Can See for Miles, Rail, Tattoo, and Odorano. The Who go to the next level. And they join the greats of rock and roll with that album. But really, to be totally honest and frank, people, this album, a quick one, this album, this amazing British album right here, is where the you join the greats. You could make a strong case for their first album, that bluesy rock and roll James Brown. That first album in 1965 where Roger's just barking out the blues. There's no blues on this album. This is like a pop, angry, confused. The Who are just pounding on the drums. They're looking for a sound on this album. And let me tell you, people, they almost damn damn near well find it here. The Who, a quick one. The second album, it's amazing. I love this album by The Who. I love the first album. But of course, with The Who sell out in 1967... That's where The Who would go to the next level. And then Tommy. I can't decide which album. Those albums are both both amazing. The Who sell out is amazing, but Tommy is incredible. Where The Who just capture the 1960s and they bottle it and they sell it. They didn't even do it at Oxford. They did it all by themselves, just with Kit Lambert and Chris Stamp producing it. They didn't have a real producer for Tommy, man. And they had Kit Lambert. And it was incredible. And I got to give Kit Lambert credit for the Who sell out. I mean, love it or hate it, man. Pete and Kit Lambert. They made an amazing album, The Who Sell Out. But there's something to be said about The Who, a quick one, 1966. And of course, 1966 would be such a great year for rock and roll on the Clark the Shark Show at one 800 4490 You're not dead. You didn't die and go to heaven. You're just sitting there in your house and you are mesmerized by the amazing, enthralling, 
Clark the Shark Show at 1-800-449-8255. The Wolfman Jack on Crack. Coming to you from the Golden EIB Sharker Phone. And I'm talking to you about the Who, a quick one. Also known as Appy Jack over in England. The Who's second album. This second album on a scale of 1 to 10. I'll give it an 8 or a 9. Ah, it's better than a 7. It's the Who. A quick one. It could have been better. Maybe if they had Shell Tell Me. Or maybe, I don't know, some other producer. It might have been better. But I gotta give Kit Lambert credit. He doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know how to record. You know, he, he's just twiddling the knobs for the U. But this album is amazing, man. And then Kit Lambert... Love him or hate him. I mean, some people hate his production. They say it's muddy and the Who sound muddled. But I don't always think so. You know, sometimes you got to take a Who album, especially from the 1960s, and you might have to adjust the treble and the mid-range and make it brighter because it's a muddy mix by Kit, Kit Lambert and the Who. But I love this album, A Quick One, and I love the Who sellout, and I love Tommy. When the Who were still this swinging British insanity uh, back in the 60s. There's no psychedelia yet here. But the Who are going in a crazy direction on this amazing album. And they're pounding away. They're, they're feeling their way. They're looking for a sound. And they would find it, people, on the next album. With Armenia City in the Sky. And I, I can see for miles. And the Rail Pots 1 and 2. Kit Lambert and The Who would find an amazing, classic album in 1967 of psychedelic pop. Oh, it's so amazing, The Who sell out. you got to love that album. It's better than Frank Zappa. It's better than The Velvet Underground. It's, it's almost weirder than The Electric Prunes or The Count Five or The Doors or anything, man. Kit Lambert. Love him or hate his mixes or his production. You know, for The Who, three albums in a row, man. He gets a sound for The Who. And this album, A Quick One or Happy Jack, as it's known, you know, I think it might be, I don't know, in England. It's a slightly different in England as it is in America. Kind of like The Who's first album. You know, A Quick One is maybe like in some weird way my favorite who album because i love the way the who are confused they kind of don't know what they're doing and they're like they're like lost on this album kind of like the beatles revolver where the beatles are lost and they're looking for a new sound and that's how a lot of bands were in 1966 a lot of american garage bands and great bands everywhere like the remains of the standells and Everybody, you know, you could tell the electric prunes were, you know, somewhere, you know, in a garage dreaming of a sound. And, and the Doors recorded that amazing first album in 1966, you know, uh, with, you know, Paul Rothschild and all those amazing people at Electro Records. But the Who, you know, there's something to be said for the Who. They're always groundbreaking. You know, a quick one, the long songs, like, nine 12 minutes long groundbreaking song man all the bands from yes to emerson lake and palmer to sticks to all of the bands in the 70s even the who themselves and tommy and the who sell out everybody wanted a long song that's 12 minutes long like genesis and it's all because of the who a quick one the original long song man the who a quick one baby the rock opera, it's not the best recording by The Who. And The Who could have done it so much better. Maybe even without Kit La Lambert, it could have been better. But I love it. As it is, I love The Who, a quick one. And I love these first two albums. You know, Shell Tell Me probably gets a better sound over in England. The American producer, Shell Tell Me, he goes over and he signs The Who into a slave contract. Where the Who are being paid like Clive Davis. They're only getting one-tenth of one mil. Less than 5% royalty. They don't even get... So for every $1,000 that the Who made, 
uh, with that contract that Shell tell me signed them. They you got like a nickel, not even a nickel, like a penny, for every one thousand quid. I, for every ten thousand quid. <laughs> In Oxford, they you got like a penny for every ten thousand pounds. <laughs> the fucking guy shall tell me. Sign the who into the the worst slave contract you could imagine, and. You know, as in 1965, and then The Who, of course, even on their first five, six albums, they had to pay Shell Talmy forever. Even on Who's Next, Won't Get Fooled Again, Baba O'Reilly, Shell Talmy owns that record. Lock, stock, frock, and barrel. <laughs> He's not even British. Shell Talmy's from America, people. He went over to England. And he signed the Who into a slave contract. But if it wasn't for Shell Tell Me, today we might know even who the Who are bloody ah. Shell Tell Me made the Who. He delivered the Who the way that the Colonel delivered Elvis. Shell Tell Me, love him or hate him. I, I fucking kind of hate Shell Tell Me. I think the guy's a fucking douchebag. But love him or hate him, he signed the Who over in England. And he got them on Decca Records. And Decca Records is the most horrible record label in England. The Who albums just always sound so crappy because of the woefully inept Decca, which later became MCA Records, of course, you know, over, over in America. But it was Shell Tell Me, got the Who signed to Decca, and that's why we had my generation. Uh, me generation and uh, kids are all right and that amazing first album by the who is because of shell tell me but the the who you know they got sued by shell tell me when they tried to weasel out of the contract but then they went over with kit lambert and they recorded this album the second album and i love this album it may not be as good as the who's first album technically but the who capture you know, I need you and Boris the Spider and, you know, so sad about us. There's something about the 1966 Who that I love. You know, I love this. And, of course, this was just the demo tape, people, for the, the Who sell out and Tommy. The Who were auditioning for themselves with Kit Lambert. And then they would go amazing with the Who sell out in 1967. Just an amazing album. One of the greatest in rock and roll. Of course, Tommy. That sold 20 million albums. Of course, one of the greatest albums ever in rock and roll. And from there, we know what happened with The Who, baby. Live at Leeds, Who's Next, Quadrophenia. <laughs> they became this British arena band wearing bell bottoms on stage in boiler suits. They no longer smashed their gear as much, but they were amazing live just so loud with Keith Moon they made your ears bleed the who. the who became rock gods with Who's Next but before that they were this amazing little band in England with these great albums the Who sell out the first album but none are really greater than this second Who album A Quick One and I love the song A Quick One you know I love Kit Lambert God bless him for recording The Who Getting them away from Shell Tell Me. Even if the Who lost money, it's all good today, Pete. You got you with two hundred million now, Pete. At one eight hundred four four ninety two five five, the fabulous Clark the Shark show. This album has it all. I need you. Where Keith Moon is pounding and singing, his drums are amazing on I Need You, and so sad about us is amazing, twangy guitar by Pete. Great bass. It's just this twangy bass by Entwistle. But he's capturing this Rickenbacker bass. And Mooney's just pounding the drums. It's just an amazing hard pop song by The Who. So sad about us. And the long, a quick one, amazing rock opera by The Who. I love this album, man. Boris the Spider's amazing. Of course, Cobwebs and Strange is incredible instrumental by The Who. Just this noisy, horrible noise that represents The Who and all the 
fabulous, horrible noise. The Who second album. You just got the testimony, the only review you'll ever need of this amazing second album by The Who. A quick one, Happy Jack. The Who, 1966, a great year for rock and roll. A rock and roll hall of fame, great year. 1966, when all these bands were changing and looking for that new sound. They all had to go into the garage to find it. You know, because 1965 is so clean. And the Beatles were so clean. It's 64. And Paul's like, I can't buy me love. And everyone's like, I got to clean. I got to get away from a clean sound to get messy, fuzz-toned, distortion boxes. All these bands in 66 were in the garage looking for this just this new sound, man. Everyone was hunting and searching for a new rock and roll garage sound. And they found it, baby, but nobody found it better than The Who. This second album is amazing. The Who, a quick one produced by Kit Lambert. It's a great raw. It's so raw. It's so natural and crude. This album is crude in a natural state. I love it, man. The Who second album, a quick one. I don't think The Who were ever much better than this. Maybe on The Who sell out and Tommy. But this is definitely the audition where The Who are like, we're going to be big. We're going to be great with you. And a quick one. The album and the song. Amazing. The Who. And you just heard the testimony, the word from the Clark the Shark Show. one 800 4492 from the Golden EIB Sharkraphone. The little Steven of the underground garage. He's better than little Steven. He's little Sharky. All five foot six of me, baby. The Wolfman Jack on crack. And you just heard the testimony about the Who's second album. A quick one. And you won't ever get a better review from all these amazing albums back in the 60s. From the U and all these other artists. You go to Clark the Shark. You go to the number one reviewer, baby, on YouTube. Strike that from the record, baby. I'm talking worldwide. In the history of mankind, you go to Clark the Shark. When you want to review albums from the 60s, 70s, you go to Clark the Shark. That's right, baby. 1-800-449-8255. The Clark the Shark Show. That's right. shark a doodle do, And I'm out of here, people. I love you all. And I thank you for listening to the Sharky. And I'm out. Peace. I'm out, baby.